cloud. Okie doke. Well, hi everybody. Good evening. Nice to see so many here. It looks like we have 93 people with us so far. There were over 130 who registered, so we may have a few latecomers, but um, we're happy to have you. Thanks for being here. Many of you know me and know our speaker too, Mike, but we always have a few new folks, for, so I hope you'll indulge me with a few introductory comments. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lucy Helfrich, the Director of Program Services for the 300 Committee Land Trust of Falmouth, and we are so glad to have you join us tonight for this special talk by Mike Tucker on birds of Upper Cape Cod. We're getting better and better at Zoom. Practice does make better, but nothing is perfect. So please note that you're all muted. We'd like you to stay muted throughout the presentation. If during the talk you have a question, please save it. And at the end, when Mike's done, he will ask for questions and you can use the chat feature to type in your question. I'm also recording the talk. The recording will be available for a few weeks for anyone. And you'll just have to email us here at the 300 Committee for the link. Quickly, I wanna say a few words about the 300 Committee, but first I wanna thank our loyal members who support our work to preserve and protect open spaces throughout Falmouth. Membership support is critical. It enables us to continue to save important land in Falmouth for conservation, recreation, and drinking water protection, to manage and steward those lands, and to provide outreach and educational programming for the public. We're closing out our 35th anniversary year this year. Since 1985, we have permanently preserved more than 2,500 acres in all of Falmouth's seven villages. Mm -hmm. These include oak and pine woods, rugged moraine, riverfront and upland, rare wildlife habitat, salt marsh, farmland, coastal and inland ponds, and more. All of these special places help make our community from Woods Hole to Wakoit a wonderful place to live and to visit. We always have new parcels under review and lining up for acquisition. We believe that our work continues, sorry, contributes to the natural, Nash, sorry, we think our work contributes to the natural beauty of Falmouth and to the quality of life here. Access to these special places is important, especially now. If you are not a member, we do so hope you will join us. You can make a contribution right from our website, 300committee.org. Thanks. And now a few words about Mike, Mike Tucker. Mike is a highly valued member of our 300 Committee volunteer team. He's an outdoor enthusiast and an avid and accomplished photographer. He loves to share his knowledge about the natural world and especially about birds. His passion for birds began with his first pair of binocular, binoculars more than 40 years ago. Since then, his career and volunteer experiences have included a wide range of field biology work and education. Mike has led bird watching trips all over the Northeast and he continues to give talks and teach workshops. Indeed, many of us have joined him, joined him on local bird walks, which are always fun and informative. Tonight, Mike will share some very beautiful photographs and stories about a number of bird species we're likely to see here with perhaps a few photography tips thrown in for good measure and some other fun stuff. So without further ado, Mike Tucker. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, this is going to be a little different than the typical sort of um, workshop uh, kind of, you know, structured sort of talk. Um, in fact, the only words you're going to see in this presentation are the words on this slide and the last slide if we get to it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, things we see, um, the occurrence of, of um, these birds here. Um, Odds and in facts, we might touch on some conservation notes here and there um, about some of these birds. And um, yeah, so we're just going to get rolling and, and uh, grab yourself a drink and sit back, relax, and here we go. The uh, first bird on the slide here, I just thought the colors seem to really work well for the first slide, um, belted kingfisher. They do breed here in Falmouth. Um, what's interesting about this bird, they actually, not too many birds form a territory in the winter, but they're very territorial about their food source. So sometimes you will see a belted kingfisher working one pond uh, area or part of a cove, and chances are you're going to see it all winter long there. It may or may not stay in that area during breeding season, um, but they're pretty amazing uh, the way they can hover. 
over the water, no problem at all, and dive head first for the fish. And it's like they have um, polarized sunglasses built in with their eyes. And um, what they can see through that glare is pretty amazing. A lot of fun to watch, as some of you probably know. It's one of these species of bird where the female has the color um, with a reddish band underneath that top band, but this is the male, it lacks the color. Um, that color, it's still plenty colorful enough. Um, you could always hear them and find them with their chatter. A, lot, a very, very fun bird, and, and uh, I heard a couple of them today, actually. I'm gonna start off by talking about something that's going on here in uh, across um, the Northern half of the United States right now. It's called, a winter finch invasion. Um, these birds are known as eruptive species. Um, and eruptive meaning that they just kind of once in a while, boom, they just show up in big numbers. And that happens to have some sort of rhyme and reason to it. And it's usually, um, actually it's always points to their food source um, and whether or not they have abundant food. And this year, um, across the Northern range where most of these birds nest, it's a considered a poor pine cone crop. So it's predictable, um, usually going into the fall um, and into summer, you know whether or not it's going to be enough food for the, for the birds to be happy up there. And this is a year they predicted that these species and some others I'll mention um, will be moving down in good numbers. Now, all these were taking in Falmouth over the last few weeks. Um, they're exciting to have around. Sometimes it will be years and years before we get a chance to see them. Um, there are more and more crossbills showing up right now. And on the left, you see a red crossbill. That was one of about a dozen I saw in a flock at Crane Wildlife Refuge, north of 151. They were flying around, working the tops of the pitch pine trees. And if you look closely, you can see that unusual bill where it crisscrosses. And that's basically a tool they have for opening up uh, pine cones that aren't even starting to open yet. Basically, um, when they close their bill, it kind of forces open these little wings in the pine cones and they could get to the seed at the base of those wings. Uh, so it's a very effective tool for them. They do nest in certain parts of New England up north across the southern part of Canada and then down through the Rocky Mountains. And depending on where they nest within that range I mentioned, there are different types. Um, they don't call them subspecies, it's a little confusing, but these types um, can, by, can be identified by calls. And the ones I heard the other day, I believe were type 10. I know it's kind of getting into advanced bird geek 101, um, but, um, but they can be identified by call. Sometimes you need a spectrograph to actually see how the notes go. Um, but anyway, just a little side note there. Um, beautiful bird, and we, we could expect white wing crossbills showing up as well. Uh, they weren't predicted to show up in the same amount of numbers, but there have been some spotted around uh, Massachusetts lately. On the right, um, probably most of you, if you have feeders, have seen pine siskins already. They came through in a big wave a few weeks ago. Um, pine siskins will associate with goldfinch flocks a lot. They sound very similar. They'll also do some more zippy notes and these high notes in flight and these chatters when they're flying around. A lot of these winter finches fly together in tight flocks. So they can, you can, they can get your attention um, where goldfinches, it might not be a tight flock of 30 birds flying around, 50, 100, you'll see that with pine siskins. Um, and they have that same undulating flight as a goldfinch has, uh, very distinct uh, flight. And they'll mix in, like I said, with the flocks. They like the niger seed, black oil sunflower, and they'll feed on, on um, a, a variety of different seeds in, in weedy gardens. And then the red pole, the common red pole, hasn't shown up in big numbers yet. I actually found this bird at the um, compost uh, site, the leaf composting site in Falmouth off Blacksmith Shop Road. There was two of them. Um, they're starting to show up in decent numbers. There's another species called a hoary red pole we don't usually see. Uh, quite as commonly, but when we get a lot of common red poles showing up, they will um, be mixed in and you need to look closely. The, the hoary red pole has, has a more frosty look to them. They're paler. The streaks on a solid. There's more white in the back and on the face. Um, very similar um, and, and they will mix together. Um, but uh, beautiful birds and keep your eyes open. Uh, all these birds will go to, will go to feeders for sure. And the red-breasted nuthatch um, is sort of lumped in with those, even though they breed around here, 
They also breed across the whole southern part of Canada. And um, because of that poor pine cone crop, we are seeing a big influx of them as well. And if you feed birds, you've probably noticed that, or if you go for walks in the woods, big numbers of them, they are just a lot of fun. They're very friendly. They seem somewhat tame. Um, and uh, again, they are um, showing up in those sort of numbers for the same reasons those other winter finches are. And of course, we're starting to see the junco showing up now. When I was at Crane the other day and I saw those um, crossbills, I probably had on a short stretch of trail over 40 juncos, uh, dark eyed juncos. Um, so, you know, listen for them. Their little chip notes give them away a lot. They, they feed in flocks along roadsides, uh, uh, the clearing and edges of fields, those sort of places, and on the ground under your feeders as well. White out of tail feathers um, when they're flitting off uh, from the roadside is, is, a, is a dead giveaway. If you don't see much or you can't see the details, sometimes those white out of tail feathers give it away easily for you. So a few uh, weeks ago, I was changing my feeders out and I decided in the middle of a feeding frenzy to put the feeders on the ground and just put some seed in my hand. And uh, yeah, it worked. Uh, the, I never had a tufted titmouse laying in my hand before. So that was a lot of fun. That was the first one that came and visited. And then the chickadee came. And then when a siskin landed in my hand, I, I think my ear to ear smile almost scared it off eventually, uh, uh, initially. But, um, but it sat there for several seconds actually eating the seed. And um, the red-breasted nuthatches kept buzzing by and buzzing by, uh, wouldn't land in my hand, but twice a red-breasted nuthatch landed on my head. And then as I'm holding my hand out and my phone across my right shoulder, on my left shoulder, red-breasted nuthatch landed. And it sat there for about five seconds as I'm slowly glancing over looking at it. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, give it a shot. It, it works pretty well. I always recommend, try don't do it when you're, uh, your feeders are full. When they're in the middle of it, your feeders are getting low, put them down, out of sight, put a little seed in your hand to where they are used to coming into the feeders, and chances are you'll get one landing in your hand. This time of year, we're starting to, uh, in the fall and, and into winter, we start hearing and seeing the golden crown kinglets a lot. Now, they migrate for the most part from points north every winter. But what a lot of people don't realize, the golden crown kinglet actually nests right here in Falmouth, which is really strange. And it's actually the only place in eastern Massachusetts and even western Massachusetts they don't commonly nest. Um, you know, you have to get up into northern New England where there are, are large patches of conifers. They have been known to nest in small patches of conifers from time to time. It's happened in Connecticut. It's happened in Rhode Island, just one here and there. But around Long Pond in Falmouth, um, there are actually at least three different locations where there are several, maybe four, where there are several golden crown kinglets nesting, which is pretty exciting. Um, this is the only place on Cape Cod, the only place in Eastern Massachusetts, um, and, uh, and they nest there. And what they like there are the very large uh, Norway spruce trees, because there's several patches of them around that property. Um, and it's just another example where you have a nice piece of conservation land that is, is left to go to forest, it's protected. Um, the spruce trees and the pine trees continue to grow and mature. And lo and behold, it becomes attractive um, for something like a golden crown kinglet. So there are some good examples of conservation success stories <clears throat> and certainly golden crown kinglets nesting here in Falmouth is one of them. Uh, ruby crown kinglets aren't as numerous as golden crown kinglets. Um, they don't nest as further south. They're more across the top of Canada, maybe certain parts of, um, I mean, above the US, US across Canada, certain parts of northern Maine. But um, they are around now. They start to peter out a little bit in the winter. They'll move a little bit further south. Um, they give their selves away by these little chatters. So they, they're very wren-like. Both of these can be very wren-like in their behavior. They're kind of flitting around in thick brush, um, very busy, always moving around. Um, but you can see the sort of distinct difference between the two. Um, occasionally, they will move together. But the, more often than not, the ruby crown kinglet is more solitary, and the golden crown kinglet likes joining flocks of other birds, um, especially in the wintertime. Some other birds that... Um, we can see around here in the fall and even into winter are these three warbler species. Now, usually warblers you think of as neotropical migrants because they're mainly insectivorous. But these are three examples um, of ones that can switch their diet. 
Um, all these birds prefer insects, especially when they're raising their young because nutritionally it provides much more, more for them. But um, they're survivors and they do not need to head down to the tropics. And the palm warbler normally winters, that's the top left bird, uh, a little further south of here in terms of decent numbers. But because of uh, Cape Cod, the situation being tempered by the ocean and, um, and lots of coastal southern New England areas, um, we usually have a handful of them wintering over in the area. And I saw one today at Peterson Farm when I went there in the rain to visit a, a rare bird that I'll be talking about shortly. Um, the orange crown warbler um, nests across Canada um, and down through the Rockies and Eastern Canada, not so much. So we don't see a lot of them here. Whenever I find one, I get pretty excited. This one here on the lower left, this orange crown warbler I found last year at Salt Pond. I found a few of them last fall. Um, I found one recently at, at a 300 committee property. Um, uh, oh, shoot, um, the one over by Atria, two ponds, I think it's called. Yes, um, so that was a nice find, and I got a few photos of that one as well. Um, they're very secretive; they stay in the they stay in the brush. Um, you don't usually get that sort of look you get that uh, where I got this photo. I, I really lucked out that day. And the uh, on the right, the yellow rumped warbler. Um, this is the myrtle subspecies is very, very numerous. Um, and, you know, they basically start invading towards the end of September, and many of them stick around these coastal areas. You'll see them in uh, coastal pond areas, feeding in the brush and the bay berries and cedar trees. Um, again, they have the ability to switch their diet. Um, you never know where they're going to pop up, but they do pretty well. And they usually respond uh, uh, to maybe some calls once in a while where you'd kind of make that so-called pishing sound. If you've ever been on my bird walks, I just go pss, 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 which simulates the sound of a distress call from something like a wren. And when these yellow rump warblers hear that, a lot of times they come in for a better look. Um, so they're a lot of fun. And sometimes there are other birds associated with them. So whenever I find a flock of yellow rump warblers, I look closely, you might find something like an orange crowned warbler or something better. A couple of northern species of sparrows here. The American tree sparrow is way up uh, in Canada. I mean, they're not even close to the US border really, but the American tree sparrow starts to show up right around now. Um, there's been a few reports around. Um, superficially, they sort of look like a chipping sparrow where you see a little bit of a rusty cap on them. You see a, a chest that doesn't have much streaking, um, much like a chipping sparrow, but they're larger. They have that bicolor bill, um, which is really unique. And um, they also have a central breast spot, which you can't see in this angle. So mostly a clear breast with a central breast spot. When people ask me about sparrows and identification, they, they usually feel very overwhelmed about it, saying they all look alike. Well, they don't. <laughs> but if you start breaking down some basics, whether or not it has streaks or not, whether or not it has a central breast spot, unusual head markings, you could start to sort them out. Um, and my absolute favorite sparrow on the right is the fox sparrow. Um, they are just so amazing looking. Um, very large sparrow, um, one of the largest sparrows around. They nest um, across Canada, southern part of Canada, parts of northern New England, way up there though. Um, but this is the time of year we start to see them. I actually took that photo last year at Peterson Farm. Um, there was a couple of them hanging out there. And along the bike path by Oyster Pond and Salt Pond and those low brushy areas is also another good spot for them. Uh, they have a very distinctive loud chip call. Um, and that usually gives them away before you see them. And incidentally, that's the key to finding birds in general um, is pay attention to what you hear. Um, and because they kind of give it, they give it up before you see them. So call notes can be tricky, but the fox sparrow has a very distinct, powerful chip note that um, is much different than the other sparrows. Just quick, quickly on a few other sparrows, the Lincoln sparrow, top left, I photographed that at the Cape Cod Organic Farms. Um, it's a really good spot for them. I went there one day because I saw that it was a good spot for them, and sure enough, I had one posing for me. Um, so that was nice. Um, they nest north of New England. Um, they just beautifully marked, very fine uh, streaks on the breast and that, that buffy uh, sort of color that goes down the flanks under the wings combined with that fine streaking and the gray and rufous pattern on the face. Very unique, beautiful, beautiful bird. 
Um, I always get excited when I come across them because you, you just don't see them in the sort of numbers that you see a lot of the other migrant sparrows in, and they can be a little secretive as well. Uh, lower left-hand side, lousy picture, but I was pretty excited. That's a clay-colored sparrow that showed up in my garden uh, one day. And it, it's actually, they're not super rare, um, but they're just tough to find. It was actually my first one on Cape living here three years and just happened to be in my yard. So I was pretty excited about that. So that's my photo record of my private little clay-colored sparrow. And just for fun, because I love the shot, and he's so darn cute. And they're very common. The song sparrow on the right, um, I just got this unusual head-on look where his crown feathers happen to be lifted up a little bit. Um, and uh, they're just a lot of fun. They they sing a lot. You know, I, I always say most birds don't sing in the winter, but you get a nice day, song sparrows will belt out their song. They're aptly named. Um, very common. I actually had at uh, Peterson Farm today in the rain, I was probably identified about 24 song sparrows or so. That beautiful garden area that's been planted right by the parking lot is fantastic. And it was just loaded with birds feeding in the seed in there. Um, so highly, highly recommend checking that out. And I'm gonna give you another good reason to check out Peterson Farm shortly. Oh, and here's why. Um, I'm gonna get into a few birds here uh, that are unique uh, uncommon or rare that have been seen around this town. And I'm gonna start with one that was about a month or so ago on the left called the Lapland Longspur. Um, as you might imagine with the name like Lapland in it, they nest up in the Arctic tundra. And starting in late September, they'll migrate through and you don't usually see them in good numbers at all. In fact, bird watchers that go out all the time may miss one, uh, one fall or winter. Uh, they might be hanging out with a flock of horn larks in a, in a big open area. Um, so sometimes they'll mix in with birds like that. Um, but they're not, they certainly don't show up in big numbers, but this one showed up at Crane Wildlife Refuge and it was right near the parking lot. And it was very cooperative. A lot of people went there and got some photos of it. And as you can see with the seeds stuck all over its bill, it was feeding just fine constantly. Um, and uh, every now and then we get some Western species that birds that are normally found west of the Mississippi that work their way out here. And this Western Kingbird on the right, um, this isn't the one that's at Peterson Farm right now. Uh, one, uh, Kevin Friel just found one there. Um, two, wait a minute, yesterday. Um, he found one there yesterday morning. Uh, he sent me a, a, a text message. He's like, yo, is this a Western Kingbird? I'm like, oh my God, yes. Um, and he got some nice photos of it. And uh, so he, nice job on Kevin. Um, this one is one I photographed last week in Barrington, Rhode Island, um, this Western Kingbird. And there, there was also one at Scusset Beach, possibly the same one that Kevin found. There was also um, a few of them around the Northeast this year. So it's always exciting when they show up. Um, to give you an idea, I've, I've only, I mean, I've been birding since I was, I don't know, 11 or so. and. Um, once I had a car, I was going everywhere, but I think I've only had Western Kingbird in all that time, six times. Um, so uh, they don't show up a lot. Um, so just to give you that idea, beautiful bird. Um, they have white outer tail feathers and that beautiful uh, yellow belly contrast and gray head. Um, and they like to perch along fences and wires and just drop down into the grass and, and hop back up on their perches to feed. So if you find them, um, they usually offer pretty good photo opportunities because you just kind of sit there and wait for them to do their thing. Another bird that showed up that um, is, we would classify as uncommon is the tricolored heron. Uh, this was last spring. Um, striking bird, very similar to a great blue heron, a little smaller but a great blue heron does not have that white belly. It does not have that purpley color to the neck. It does not have those white patches uh, going up into the shoulder. Um, so those combinations kind of make it stand out. That white belly, the distance is usually key for easily identifying a tricolored heron across a marsh, uh, quickly sorting it out from a great blue. Um, this was over at South Cape Beach and it was just, showing off for me. Um, he's like, let me preen here. Let me open my wing. Uh, let me turn around. Let me put a fish in my bill for you. Uh, so it was kind of nice, nice opportunity. Um, they do breed uh, in Massachusetts in a couple of places. Um, it's usually been a southeastern U.S. Uh, coastal bird, um, but, you know, 
like a lot of the egrets and herons, they've creeped up a little bit, but they have not taken off like snowy egrets and great egrets. Um, for whatever reason, they, they just don't have that same sort of prolific nature and, and being able to spread their population as easily as those. But they're still around and, and it's exciting when one shows up. South Cape Beach is just an amazing place. They get a lot of good stuff there. And this bird showed up in May on the left, Prothonotary Warbler. Um, it's a cavity nester. Uh, they nest across, uh, starting like usually the normal range is kind of like through New York, uh, down through the Midwest area, uh, down south. Um, uh, you know, they, they're cavity nesters, uh, which is unusual for warblers. Um, but nonetheless, that's what they do. This one showed up over by um, uh, well, geez, uh, the pond over in Mashpee. Geez, I can't think of it right now. Anyway, <laughs> sorry about that. It'll come to me probably by the end of the talk. But when people hear about a bird like this, they go there quickly and I was one of them. And sure enough, it cooperated for a lot of people. And uh, as you can see, I mean, he's like, let me sing for you. Um, and it was great. Um, stuck around for a while, a lot of people got to see it. And it was identified, um, the person who found it identified it by its song. And again, uh, learning the songs and the calls um, you know, they're not all going to hop in the open and make it easy for you. Um, so it goes a long ways when you can learn the songs and calls. On the right is uh, much more rare, actually, than the prothonotary warbler on the left. On the right is a black-throated gray warbler uh, found at Salt Pond. Um, that was over a year ago. And that was a fantastic find. That was the best photo I could muster up. Um, other people got some better photos of it. But when the rarities like this show up, word spreads quickly, and it's fun to go chase them down and, and see if you could add it to your local list. And that was one that I lucked out with. I was actually there within an hour of it being spotted because people uh, network things out nicely. It makes it nice. Um, so of course, being a coastal town like we are, it's a great spot for gulls. And normally we have uh, certainly laughing gulls, Bonaparte gulls, um, herring gulls, ringbill gulls, uh, great blackback gulls, and all those are pretty common. Further out on the Cape, you can expect the rarities uh, with a much more frequency. Um, you know, out in Provincetown, Wellfleet, in those areas, the, the arm of the Cape just catches all kinds of these, these gulls that follow fishing boats in and, and just stay out over the open water more. But once in a while, um, it's nice when one shows up here in town. And I found this black-headed gull on the left last year, roosting with laughing gulls. You could see for comparison, the laughing gulls. But what a black-headed gull most closely resembles is a Bonaparte skull, but its head is a little bit cleaner with that smaller um, spot on the head uh, in this plumage and the bill is reddish color instead of all black on the Bonaparte's and the legs are brighter as well. And the bird is overall paler. So it just stood out like a sore thumb. I was driving down Surf Drive and I saw it sitting on a jetty. I was like, whoa, that looks different. So that was nice. And the one on the right, I actually photographed today. Um, that is a lesser blackback gull. Um, I ran out to do a few errands and I thought I'd go check out Woodneck Beach. When I first moved here a few years ago, I found a lesser blackback gull at Woodneck Beach. And um, I walked out to the beach and one went flying by me. I'm like, that looks too small for a great black back. And it eventually uh, landed and I was able to get a few photos. Um, so they're not super rare. Out on the further out on the Cape, they show up in good numbers, but you know, it, not very common in this, this end of the Cape at all. So it's, it's noteworthy. And it was, it was fun to get a photo of that today. This is an adult bird. What separates them from a great black back is the fact that it's smaller its legs are yellow instead of a, a fleshy color. The head is more rounded, the bill is more slender, and the back isn't as black. In fact, if you look closely at this bird, it's a dark gray in a contrast with the black wingtips, where a great black back gull, the, the back of the bird and the wingtips are basically the same sort of blackness. Um, so, and it's a little bit smaller than a herring gull, where a great black back gull is actually larger than a herring gull. And you can really see that size difference when it's sitting with other birds. So that was a fun bird. And if you're in the Woodneck Beach area, go look for the lesser blackback gull. I bet you it'll hang out there for a while. Whoops. One day I had a doctor's appointment <laughs> and in Mashpee. And before I went there, I decided to uh, drive down Redbrook Road and go check out Redbrook Reservoir. And I was so excited to see lots of mud exposed out there. And um, I walked down to the pond edge with my camera in hand 
and I was super excited to be photographing a solitary sandpiper that was very close to me. While I am holding my camera, all of a sudden went swimming by right in front of me was a Wilson's phalarope and my jaw hit the ground. I'm like, oh my God, um, that is a really good bird for this end of the Cape. They show up in a few numbers out, out in Provincetown and Truro area and some of the beaches out there. Uh, but it's very unusual for this part of the Cape. In fact, it's so unusual when I put it out on eBird over the course of the next week, dozens and dozens of people were stopping by Redbrook Reservoir to photograph this bird. So it was kind of fun to find it and, and see others get excited over it as I was. And uh, it was very cooperative, hung out for a while and um, offered a lot of nice photos for folks. Redbrook Reservoir, the, um, the pond level dropped uh, considerably because of an issue with the dam, but um, that actually ended up being a very good thing because even though we have a lot of coastline around here, we do not have a lot of tidal mudflats that shorebirds will frequent. There are a few places where it gets a little low, Great Sabuisset Marsh um, at low tide has some exposed sandbars and some mud areas along some of the creeks, but nothing like some of the large mudflat areas that attract hundreds and hundreds of shorebirds. So when all of a sudden that little pond turned into one giant mudflat, um, there were lots of shorebirds there, hundreds. Um, in this one little area. And there was some good stuff there too. So it was exciting to see that. And, um, and it would be a nice way to actually manage that pond to drain it towards the end of summer, expose the mud, uh, because migratory stopover spots um, are pretty important for shorebirds because they spend very little time on their breeding grounds and um, most of their life is migrating. And finding good uh, migratory habitat is, is vital for their survival and any little bit helps. Um, but anyway, that is a Wilson's phalarope. So I haven't talked too much about photography yet. Um, I, I'll, I'll touch on it here and there. Uh, people will ask me about my settings once in a while. Um, and I don't know if this is the best slide to talk about that. But <clears throat> in general, for sitting birds like this grasshopper sparrow on the right, <clears throat> and um, or, the, or a flying bird like the Easter Meadowlark on the left, and that's an Easter Meadowlark above it as well. I try to always be aware of what's going to give me the best overall quality. So I met somebody the other day um, at the rare bird, uh, the cuckoo that showed up, the common cuckoo that showed up in Rhode Island. It's a big deal. It was on the news and everything. People from all over America were coming to see that bird. But she was disappointed with her photos because um, when the bird was sitting in a tree, it was somewhat shaded. They were all grainy and they didn't, they didn't look very sharp. And I said, well, what's your shutter speed? And she says, well, I have it at like one five thousandth of a second or one four thousand. I'm like, that's way too high. She says, well, I want to be ready for when it flies. Well, it's hard to have the best of both worlds. When you have your shutter speed that high, I'm going to try not to get too technical here. That simply means that your camera needs to be more sensitive to, to light because it's opened up just a very fraction. It's a tiny, tiny fraction when it's a fast shutter speed. And the more light sensitive you make your camera, the more grainy it's going to look in the end. So that affects what they call the ISO or the light sensitivity for the camera. So in order to pull off a shutter speed that fast, you have to bump up your ISO pretty high which is unnecessary on a sitting bird like this on the right. If I would have shot that at 5,000th of a second, my ISO would have been very high and I would not have been able to crop in without seeing all kinds of graininess. So I always think technically, I'm like, okay, can I get away with holding that at a 500th of a second? And can I bring that ISO all the way down to a low number so I can just crop in and maintain clarity all the way through? So that's one of the things I think about. I always approach it with a very technical uh, aspect to it. And, and do what I have to, to get as low of an ISO as I can. Sometimes people say, why are you shooting such a low shutter speed? Well, my camera rattles off 10 frames a second. So if eight out of those 10 are blurry, that's fine because I am going for a good sharp, sharp shot um, that will allow me high clarity and high resolution and a lower ISO will do that. Sometimes you can't get away with that, but when I can, I do. Um, another note conservation note here. So these are grassland nesting birds, Easter Meadowlark on the right, grasshopper sparrow on, on, I mean, on the left, grasshopper sparrow on the right. And um, we are very fortunate here in Falmouth to have um, probably the best uh, grassland for these birds in, in all 
of Massachusetts, certainly for grasshopper sparrow. And the management that they chose to do over there in, in maintaining that as a grassland and opening up the grassland has really paid dividends because grassland nesting birds have declined well over 70 to 75% over the course of the last 30 to 40 years. And, and most of that is due to loss of habitat. So it's a really good conservation success story to see that property is identified. It's actually physically managed and created to, to attract certain species that are, are in peril, that are really declining quickly, and it worked. Um, so it's a very good thing. Um, and it's easy to see these birds there. Uh, they are very visible. The grasshopper sparrows nest abundantly around that property. It doesn't matter where you walk, they nest near the parking lot. Um, they are all over the place in there. And it's just a beautiful place to visit uh, for that reason only. Um, and also, the blue grosbeak speak on the left, it's the only place in Massachusetts where they have successfully nested, right here in Falmouth. In fact, um, they haven't even nested in Rhode Island until this past year. One showed up in one property and nested there. So it's a very special thing to get that bird nesting there. And for a number of years now, it has successfully nested every year. Um, and it's uh, one of those specialty birds that we have right here in town. Um, additionally, American Kestrel nests in Falmouth in good numbers. And they nest on that property and a few others. And that bird probably further out on the Cape you're lucky if there's even one. And between the property at Crane and the, um, the uh, reserve to the north, the, uh, the base um, where there's a lot of grassland up there, uh, they're nesting in there as well. So this part of Falmouth and this end of the Cape does really well with American Kestrel, which I do not have a photo of. And, and another grassland nesting bird that uh, really flourishes at Crane is the Savannah Sparrow on the right. Similar looking to a song sparrow, the streaks are a little bit finer and you have that yellow in the lore, the tail is a little shorter and they like the grasslands and they have a very thin wispy sort of song um, that's very unique, uh, much more softer and zippy sounding than a uh, higher pitch than a song sparrow. Oh, we got some cuties here. <laughs> Everybody loves baby killdeer. Um, so this also is a crane. Uh, so crane offers it's a really special spot. And killdeer is in the plover family. Um, you know, I, when I used to work at Audubon, I would get calls, hey, you need to come over here. There's a piping plover nesting on the roof of, of Walmart and it's and the babies are on the ground. I'm like, that's not a piping plover, that's a killdeer. Um, you really don't look anything like a piping plover in my opinion, but um, they're in the same family anyhow. But anyway, these little babies are just so cute. I took a friend out there, we were looking for the blue grosbeak, and as we just about as we were getting back to the parking lot, um, we saw mama getting a little nervous and we figured that my babies must have been around and all we did was just stand there and uh, we didn't approach them. And she just kind of stood guard as you could see her on the right as the babies are walking around doing their thing. I laid, uh, got down on my belly and, uh, and these little guys just walked right out in the middle of the path for me and just, yeah. <laughs> it's a good feeling getting pictures of those little guys. They are just unbelievably adorable. Um, and those are killdeer. And there are a few places around town where they might nest. Um, I, I've heard of a couple of rooftops where they've actually nest, one of the schools in town, actually. Another specialty bird in our town, um, and a lot of coastal towns around uh, New England, is the salt marsh sparrow but it's a very narrow habitat. I mean, you get outside of, of coastal New England and, and you go interior, you're just not gonna see them because their habitat is salt marshes. But unfortunately, these guys are in danger. Um, their, their population in the last, oh, what is it? 15 years, it's declined 80%, eight zero in 15 years. And uh, with ocean uh, levels rising, um, that puts them even more uh, peril because of the spring tides and storm tides, which has already been an issue, but now that's becoming more of an issue uh, for these established uh, marshes that um, just aren't growing with the tide. Uh, they're slowly getting covered up. They also have been affected by invasive species, uh, Phragmites, uh, taking over certain parts of marshes and um, not having that 
that spartina, that that grass that they need in order to survive. Um, so yeah, they. Some scientists believe that in 50 years, they're going to go extinct unless we can make some real major changes here. That's pretty scary. In our lifetime, this bird may disappear forever. Um, well, some of our lifetimes, you know, I hope it'll be, <laughs> I hope I'll be around in 50 years, we'll see. Um, but it's kind of a, a scary thing when you think about it. And um, a lot of salt marshes have changed um, through development, so tidal, uh, flow has been affected by by drainage for open boat channels. There are a lot of factors involved to this bird um, declining. Um, but just to give you an idea, they are here. And I took these photos. Um, I think both of these were at Little Sipawisset Marsh over by Woodneck Beach. Whoop. Everybody's familiar with these big, giant, prehistoric looking things, the great blue herons. But what a lot of people don't realize, and I didn't realize, they don't commonly nest on Cape Cod. Um, so, you know, these birds nest in a number of different places and they spread out to coastal areas outside of breeding season and non-breeding birds, um, if they're not adults yet, sometimes it might take a few years for them to breed, will be around salt marshes and ponds at any time of year. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're breeding around here. So when I found a nest colony, a rookery, that included over a dozen nests. I didn't think it was that big of a deal, but Mark Faraday explained to me that that is the only confirmed real nest rookery of great blue herons ever found on Cape Cod. Um, and I was pretty excited that I, I found it. Um, some people may have knew, known about it, um, but the people who, who liked to track those things didn't know about it. So it was kind of fun to uh, go back and get some photos of them on the nests and, uh, and I just figured I'd throw in a flight shot I took the other day of, of this prehistoric looking thing flying by me. Um, but they're pretty impressive birds. And they, like I said, they, the numbers overall are doing pretty well. Generally, they like nesting in standing deadwood swamps where it'll be over a big swampy area and some of the trees just aren't making it anymore and they, they nest in these areas. But where I found the colony was a little unusual. This rookery was in a actual forested area that had a few dead trees, but no water anywhere under it or near it. Um, not, a, not a long flight. So it was a little unusual, but, but nice to come across. And no, I'm not gonna give up where it is, sorry. Um, green herons uh, are pretty common and they nest around here as well. Just a lot of fun. Um, I was out on a pond uh, with my friend and, and this one on the left was putting on a little bit of a show catching frogs and tadpoles and in between frogs and tadpoles and dragonflies, you name it. And um, so it was kind of fun getting shots of them. They tend to be a little bit more showy and, and uh, do more fun things than the great blue herons. Um, you know, I, I have pictures of them staying on the ends of branches and, and snagging dragonflies as they fly by, um, running around in a pond and, and frantically diving. I have a picture of one hanging off a branch upside down and then uh, putting its head out like a spear and still held it onto the branch while grabbing a fish that was swimming by. So they do a lot of unusual things. Um, they don't usually wade around in the water like great blue herons do. They usually will perch up on a rock, a branch, a stick, or uh, you know an embankment, and they usually hunt from up above the water. So a little different in that regard. But striking bird and uh, about the size of a crow. Couple more in that same family, yellow crowned night heron on the left. Um, they nest in a few places on the Cape and you can see them around uh, some of the marshes here once in a while. Um, this particular shot, um, I got out near Barnstable. Um, I forget the name of the property, Oneida or something like that. It, it's a, uh, I think it's a Barnstable Land Trust property, um, but there's a lot of them there and a lot of egrets. They all go there at the end of the day to roost around the edge of the pond. And the great egret on the right, um, it's funny, it's kind of like a great blue heron. As much as we see um, great blue herons and great egrets, they don't nest in the many place, as many places as you think. Um, some of the colonies can be pretty big on some of the islands where they nest and they spread out and non-breeding birds will be around throughout the summer in some places. But this one was taken over at Salt Pond. Uh, hold on, I have something in my way here. Uh, how do I make this disappear? 
ah, it's not a great eager. I thought so. <laughs> All the, the band of uh, photos was in the way there. And I, 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 I thought, wait a minute, I'm pretty sure I posted a snowy egret. That's a snowy egret photo. Just looking at the back half of the bird with no, no size scale and you can't see the legs. So you, you can't tell if you don't see the face. Um, but the snowy egret is much smaller than a great egret as the all black bill. Um, and uh, they will be very, uh, frantic sometimes running around in shallow water and their antics can be a little fun to watch as well as they go prancing around with their head all raised up and, and diving down in the water. They'll open their wings to kind of scare fish in one direction sometimes in like a little section, they'll go running around like a nut and then they'll work them into a corner and they start stabbing at them, trying to grab them. Um, I mean, watching the behavior of birds is to me is, is really the funnest thing. The scene, it's one thing, but really getting a chance to sit down and enjoy it and seeing some unusual behavior, there's nothing like it. So uh, I'm gonna check the time here. Okay, wow, time's flying. Um, another one, we don't have too many shorebirds that actually nest around here. Um, piping plovers do, um, uh, you know, kill deer um, technically in the shorebird family, but they don't usually nest uh, at the water's edge. Um, but the willet is, is one of the ones we have that nests around here. They're very vocal. So they'll be out in some of the large marshes like Great Sipawissip Marsh, Little Sipawissip Marsh um, over by uh, South Cape Beach. And um, they purr willet, purr willet, 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 willet. Very, very noisy, screaming it all over the place, flying all over the place. Um, and sometimes they'll perch up nicely for you and show off. Um, the one on the left was actually over by Black's Beach. I uh, Black Beach. I walked out um, and I was watching this guy work in the little tidal. There's a little section of water that was socked in uh, from the tide, but there's some small fish, and I, I got lucky and, and managed to uh, get a shot of one with an actual fish in its mouth. And typically, they don't really eat fish. Um, so it was kind of fun for a couple of reasons getting that photo. Usually, they go for smaller invertebrates, things that aren't quite as fun to look at as a big fish in its mouth, um, but that was fun. And uh, the uh, flight shots, you could see they kind of stand out like a sore thumb with that bold white and, and blackish pattern on the uh, going down across the wings. And again, very vocal. At a distance, they look similar to greater yellow legs, but that bill is much heavier and it's, it's black as opposed to the more uh, lighter color bill and their legs are also um, jet black as opposed to the yellowish orange color of the yellow legs. Another specialty bird for our town is the worm-eating warbler. Um, this is one of the species that traditionally, historically nested in southeastern the United States and its range has been slowly increasing north and east in areas where conservation has done a good job. Um, so western parts of Rhode Island has a lot of conservation land between state protected land, um, Audubon property, Nature Conservancy property, where the forests have been allowed to mature and, and these birds started showing up. Now, some birds have a very narrow habitat requirement. Um, and this one, it's a little unusual. They like rocky deciduous slopes. So you get these, these hillsides with a lot of rock outcroppings that have mature deciduous trees, and it's a large enough uh, section of woods, they show up. So that particular habitat happens to exist around Long Pond. And there are several places around Long Pond where this bird nests. And there's probably only one or two other places on all of Cape Cod where they nest, but it's a hot spot around Long Pond. Um, so a, another good one nesting at Long Pond, like the Golden Crown King that I mentioned earlier. Ruffed grouse is another good one that, that does very well around Long Pond. In Rhode Island, they're practically impossible to find now. And surprisingly, here on Cape Cod, there are a number of places, and Long Pond happens to be a really good spot for them. Everybody loves owls. So the great horned owls nest in a few places around here. And hold on, I'm trying to pull something up here. And uh, one day, I was uh, going for a walk in one of my favorite little conservation areas. And in the middle of the day, I heard a great horned owl calling. I'm like, huh, well, that's weird. And uh, I mean, I've heard them in the daytime before, but on three different trips, um, the middle of the day, I heard great horned owls calling. It was always very close to a very busy trail. And um, I told a friend of mine and he went there and he, and he heard it too. And he says, hey, I think I found the nest. 
And uh, sure enough, he did. And we kept going back, paying attention to the development of the babies. And on the left, it's when they uh, finally ventured out and started what they call branching, getting out onto the branches. And eventually, they uh, ended up on the ground, which is normal. Sometimes they fly up on the branches. But one day, the nest disappeared. It was just gone. A storm must have blew it down. So uh, we were a little concerned. And after a little effort, the uh, great horned owls, there were two of them, were found. Um, and they were safely off the ground, sitting low in branches. And this one on the right was, was one of them. Uh, you can see it's a little bit further along than the picture on the left. And they were very cooperative. Uh, we didn't stay long. I just, I wanted to look them over, make sure that they, that wings seemed to be normal. There wasn't any problems or issues. It wasn't, we weren't really sure what happened when the nest came down. I mean, I was there for their benefit, but they were there for my benefit too. I'm like, all right, I'm checking you guys out, but I'm going to take your photo while I'm here. Um, so that was kind of fun. Wow, somebody's got a really cool background on there. Uh, all right, I'm distracted here. <laughs> I'm going to keep going here. Um, but they nest in several places uh, around town. I've heard them in um, Milt and Sue Williamson. I don't know how you did that, but it looks like you're sitting at a lake somewhere up in Maine. That's pretty cool. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we have other species of owls around. On another property, that's a 300 committee property. Get out on 300 committee property walks, folks. Um, you're gonna see a lot of cool stuff. I found this barn owl, but I won't say which property. I, I try to keep owl locations pretty quiet. Um, but anyway, this barn owl, um, I should mention finding owls in general, people say, well, how in the world do you find them? I mentioned earlier, pay attention to sounds. Um, you know, Listen to what's going on around you because this barred owl I found because it was being harassed by blue jays. You know, blue jays are noisy as it is, but when they, you get a few of them doing a mobbing behavior where it's nonstop, they're getting really loud and they do some unusual sort of uh, scolding calls. Generally, they might have an owl or, or, or a hawk or something like that, but they do that to owls a lot. And sure enough, that's how I found this barred owl. And I just, what well, this was actually taken from quite a, quite a ways away. I zoomed in and cropped in. And I just found a spot up on a hill that kind of reduced the angle a little bit. It was difficult to find a clearing through all the branches. And it just sat there. And I'm like, all right, got a few shots. And I left it alone. And the screech owl on the right, I found the same way prior to me building that box and it nesting in the box. Um, I was working outside one day and I heard chickadees, tufted titmouse, uh, blue jays and oh God, I don't know what else. There's a whole bunch of birds scolding in a stand of bamboo near my shop over here. And I heard it two days in a row. It was really difficult to look into the bamboo. And sure enough, eventually I saw a poor screech owl getting mobbed by a whole bunch of little birds. And um, I built a box, long story short, it used it, had babies and it worked. And I've actually had uh, three different boxes in three years. Um, used by screech owls, two on this property and, and one on my neighbor's property. So they love using nest boxes. Put up a box and, um, and it might work, especially if you think you might have screech owls around. They, they take to them pretty quickly and easily. Here's a bird that people usually associate with winter flocks in places like the big grassy areas over at Scusset Beach, large cut corn fields. Um, they'll form big flocks sometimes and end up in places like that and barrier beaches. But what a lot of people don't realize, they actually nest around here. Um, there aren't too many places where they nest, but the long uh, section of, uh, what's it called? The Dead Neck Trail heading out South Cape Beach that goes out to the, uh, the east end of Coit Bay. Um, there's a section, a wide section of dunes in there that's off limits. You got the trail on one side, you got the beach on the other. And in that sandy area, in that dune area, you have horned larks that nest in there. So that's kind of exciting. And I didn't realize that right away. Um, I found these during breeding season or just before breeding season at a time where I really didn't expect them to be around anymore. Uh, but there they were. Uh, fun bird, beautiful bird. You can see why they called horned larks with the little horns on their head and the tufts of feathers. Um, just to get into a few species to wrap it up here with warblers. Um, so a lot of people don't realize how many different colorful warblers we actually have breeding around here. 
And, um, and these are two of the brightest ones we have. On the left is a prairie warbler. Um, just a lot of fun stories with those guys. This high pitched sort of rising song that they make. Um, it was one of the first warblers I found nesting when I was a kid, uh, taking nest material back along the edge of a, a power line right away. They love power line areas, uh, clearings. They, you might even hear one singing at the edge of a ball field. They might decide to make a nest. A number of different sort of clearings around ponds and clearings and sometimes even large yards. They'll nest in places like that. Um, and yellow warblers, uh, that and then some. Um, their, their, their breeding habitat is even is even more uh, abundant uh, than, than the prairie warbler because they will take brushy areas, uh, places like um, salt pond trails going behind the pond where you get all that low scrubby brush. It's loaded with yellow warblers in there. In fact, I think that's where I got this photo, either that or Peterson Farm. Um, but they do very well around here and you learn their song and you'll find them easily. Um, they say, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet, if you put it to words. And if you hear that high pitch, and once you realize that, that's what they do over and over again. So this, this picture on the left, um, you know, I talked earlier about lowering my shutter speed and trying to get as much sharpness as I can. On a bright day, with the, with the large lens that I use, I try to shoot at one one thousandth of a second and f8. Now, f8 refers to the lens opening. So on the particular lens that I have, it does a couple of things. It's known as the lens sweet spot. It happens to be the sharpest setting for that particular lens. But what that aperture also does, it gives you a little added depth of field. A lot of people will shoot their lens like mine wide open at 5.6 because it allows more light in. But the only problem is when you're close to a bird, like you're close to this bird, the eye might be in focus, but the tail might be blurry because you're so close that that, sh that depth is very shallow. When you shoot at something like F8 on a close bird, you can have the, the beak, the eyes, the feet, and the tail sharp. Um, so I do that whenever I can as, as the light allows. And on a, on a bird like this, I may even drop down my shutter speed even lower. So I have an extremely low ISO, so I could just crop it right on the face and head only if I wanted to, where if it was in low light, I could never even think about doing that. And um, anyway, I could go on and on about photography. That could be a whole nother talk. A couple of other local breeding warblers around here that are less visible, but, but around nonetheless, are American Red Starts. Um, around Goodwill Park is a great place for them. There's some places along um, Oyster Pond Road, some of the wooded areas between Woods Hole and, and uh, Surf Drive. Um, some places along the bike path where they do very well. They like uh, fairly large trees, uh, kind of shaded areas with a, a fairly dense understory. And um, beautiful little birds. The females, where you see that jet black, it's more of a dark gray. And where you see that bright salmon color, it's more of a dull yellow, um, but pretty much the same pattern overall. And this little plump looking guy on the right is a Northern Perilla warbler. The Northern Perilla, if you look at the breeding atlas of Cape Cod, they don't breed in a lot of places on Cape Cod, but they actually do pretty well here in Falmouth, I've discovered. Um, I started noting different places and right on my little side private road that I'm on, they nest here as well. And I found a few other places around town, but when they come through in mid-May, when they're migrating, you can find a lot of them around, but some of them will actually stick around to breed as well. Common yellow throat, very common nester around here. It's striking little bird, lone ranger bird as some people like to call them with the little black mask that goes across. A little unusual uh, in terms of their behavior for a warbler, they, they act like a wren or they'll actually cock their tail up a lot. They'll even chatter much like a wren does. And they'll even be in the same sort of low dense brush and, and uh, thickets much like a wren would be as well. But if you get an opportunity to get them out in the open, uh, like I lucked out here, you really get to see their striking beauty, just a phenomenal looking bird. I was hiking around Long Pond one day and I was trying to get photographs of the golden crown kinglets in one of the stands of spruce where they were nesting. And while I'm standing there, this guy just flew right next to me, the black and white warbler on the right. I'm like, all right, I will take your picture if you're gonna do that for me. And uh, fortunately I was able to get it before it flew. Um, but there are a number of species of warblers that nest around here and, and being able to 
hear them and pick up on call notes is really, even if you don't know what the song is, if something sounds different or unusual, uh, don't keep walking, stop, look for it. You might learn a new song, you might find a bird you haven't seen yet. Um, so, you know, I, I use my ears all the time. It's one of my most favorite things to do when I'm on a walk in the woods. Oven bird on the left, very common bird in the, some of the heavily wooded areas around town, loaded with them around Long Pond, BB Woods, um, you know, a number of places where we have large stands of woods. They spend most of their time on the ground, but they'll go up on branches and sing up high. Very loud, very vocal birds. They're called an oven bird because they make a little tiny nest on the ground that looks like a Dutch oven. So it's, it's domed and it has a little opening on the side. Um, another good reason to stay on the trails and to leash your dogs. Even on places where people love letting their dogs off leashes like Peterson Farm, that drives me crazy. Sorry, side note there. But anyway, I wish people wouldn't do that, especially during breeding season um, because these birds and many other birds nest on the ground and it's very disruptive. Um, it's very disruptive in places that are actually set aside for conservation property. Um, so I do my best to spread that good word when I can, but I realize some places it's kind of a lost cause. Um, but anyway, that's the oven bird. And the pine warbler on the right is another bird that's that a warbler is not necessarily uh, a big migrant. It's not a neotropical migrant. Like those other birds we talked about earlier, they can switch the diet. In this part of Cape Cod, we actually have pine warblers wintering over in fairly decent numbers. Um, there aren't too many places in southern New England where they do that, but this is one of the areas where they do. And they'll go to, uh, they'll go to feeders, they'll grab seed once in a while, they go to suet. Um, beautiful little bird. This is a female. I just posted this instead of a male. I always post male shots, but I, I kind of like the way this one looked um, on the branch in the background, so I figured I'd throw this one in there. I always look for non-cluttered backgrounds if I can for bird photography. It's not always easy to do, um, but I try to make that happen. And that is all I have, folks. I left some contact info there for you. If you have any questions, don't ever hesitate to email me. I'm always welcome to, um, I always welcome questions, um, different thoughts you may have. Um, so please feel free. Now I believe, let's see, where do I go? To, uh, chat, whoa, 14 of them, okay. All right, let me start, scroll up to the top here. Uh, do crossbills eat Niger from a feeder? Um, they will, you, you're more apt to, to get them going for seeds, uh, the larger seeds. Um, and I've seen them on trays, uh, photos, a lot of photos of them on, on feeding trays more often than not. So on my pole where I have a, a cage type feeder hanging, I also have a flat tray for the birds that prefer that. I keep hoping an evening grosbeak is going to show up because that's one of those eruptive species that's also expected. And I, I have seen one around town, but I've yet to have one in my yard. Um, but a lot of things prefer those trays and I keep a squirrel baffle underneath that so squirrels can't get up to the tray and hoard everything there. Um, uh, focal length on my lens, I use 500 uh, millimeters. Um, I, I have a Nikon zoom that's 200 to 500, and um, almost everything I shoot is at 500. Uh, quick side note, I really messed up the first day the common cuckoo showed up in Rhode Island. I went over there, and the bird was posing everywhere. I mean posing. And I'm almost embarrassed to say every single one of my 400 shots were at 200 millimeters instead of 500 millimeters. And I just missed out on killer close-ups and I can't believe I didn't notice it. I just I have no idea why I've never done that before. So I went back and kind of made up for it, but I still had better poses the first day. Um, what is eBird? eBird, good question. And, and I highly recommend checking it out. eBird is a national database kind of citizen science sort of thing where everybody can report their bird sightings. Um, it's overseen by reviewers in case something pops up crazy that doesn't make sense, where they may ask a few questions or they may ask for evidence, photos, better description, that sort of thing. Um, I don't use it as much as I should. I use it when I find fun stuff. Some people use it for everything. Some people drive down the road and, and when they pull into a parking lot, they write, they write down what they saw on that drive and they send it into eBird right away. Some people are crazy religious about it, which is a good thing. Over time and the number of people doing it, it's a very helpful tool to understanding uh, bird distribution, whether it's seasonal, uh, wintering birds, uh, you know, breeding in a certain area. Um, 
hot spots that that people go to a lot. You get a better feel for what's actually going on there. Um, but eBird's very cool, and you can access the numbers um, and look at maps and and click on species, and 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 you can kind of do research on on looking for certain birds. It's a nice tool. And and uh, yeah. Uh, where is that grassland? Uh, the grassland that I was talking about was the Crane Refuge off Route 151, the Crane Wildlife Management Area. Huge, huge grassy fields back in there. Um, it's not the sort of grass composition for something like bobolinks, but it's ideal for grasshopper sparrows and, and meadowlarks and those sort of things, and savanna sparrows. Um, that's the largest one around here. Um, the other part of the crane that's south of 151 is more of a patchwork that's managed for more like brushland birds and, and woodcock and those sort of things. So you have small sections of fields with tree lines. Uh, some are, are overgrown, some are cut short. It's, it's, uh, that's a nice spot to check out too. You get different sorts of birds there. Crane Reservation 151, yes, you're welcome. Yes, that's exactly right behind the old movie theater, which Typical, that's what we always used to say in Rhode Island. It's where this used to be or where that used to be because I never knew there was a movie theater there because I just moved here. Um, didn't catch the name of this bird. Shoot. The um, green heron. We got oh, that. Okay. We got the answer. All right. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh, yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Did you get to the question about owl boxes from Catherine? Uh, no. Okay. No, she, it, it was a private question. I think she intended it to go to you. A, qu a question, if you get to it, do you have any advice for owl boxes, location, height, facing what direction, design, plan source, what yep. time of year should, should they go up? Well, there's a lot of literature online for, now the owl boxes you're gonna have luck with here are really just Eastern Screech Owl for the most part. Barred owls will sometimes use a box, uh, but Eastern Screech Owls are much more common and they take the boxes easily. Um, a lot of designs online, uh, most of them are pretty basic. It's a three inch hole. Um, I try to get them at least 12 feet off the ground. I think the one I have is closer to 20 in my yard. And then I got another one that's about 15 feet up. Um, there's a lot of literature that talks about facing certain directions and stuff. I do not get hung up on that. I look at the layout of the property and see what actually makes sense. Because sometimes facing another direction where it's a quiet area, um, where it's actually more sheltered from the wind, where it actually might it, despite what the prevailing wind is, um, you know, the, the layout of the property might dictate a different spot. Uh, so I, I try to find an area where it's overlooking a clearing. Um, you don't want any branches crisscrossing or going right underneath it. So ideally clearing any branches off underneath it, at least going down quite a ways from the box. Uh, facing a clearing, uh, having some cover nearby is always good. And uh, yeah, I mean, just get it up there. You never know. I've, I've seen them use uh, boxes in some crazy places at times. Um, a, uh, are you shooting handheld? Yes, I, I do not use a tripod ever. Um, so I, I, I use vibration reduction with the lens that I use. I, I have a shoulder sling sort of harness that attaches to the lens and not the camera body. So the weight isn't hanging off the camera. Um, and uh, works out pretty well. And, uh, you know, bird photography, you know, I, I didn't get into to ethics a little bit, but, you know, you, you need to be careful. You need to be aware of nesting birds and breeding birds. You need to give them their space. It's the object of wildlife photography isn't getting as close as you can. And it seems like a lot of people think that's what the object is. Get as close as you can. Get that shot. Get that shot. No, no. The object is let them be safe. Sometimes it's going to work out. Sometimes they're going to come to you. Sometimes you can get a little closer. Um, but uh, the main thing is their, their welfare is what you want to keep in mind. Uh, try not to get too carried away for that shot. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, one more comment, Mike, from yeah. John Flynn. He wanted you to know that they have nesting grasshopper sparrows on the edge of the driving range at Caution Valley Country Club. Oh, that's great to hear. It must be a nice little fringe sort of habitat there. Um, oh yeah, I just saw that. Yeah, that's great to hear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, this, I mean, I guess you, you get a hot spot in town like this, is it's gonna start spreading out a little bit. Somebody, I got blue scribble all over my screen for some reason. <laughs> I don't know I what that up. is, that's funny. So, <laughs> Lots of thank yous and one more thing, something about yeah. it's having an owl box like letting a cat out to eat small birds. 
No, not at all. Not at all. In fact, um, you know, I, I get those comments a lot where people get all upset about something like a Cupid's hawk or a Sharpshin hawk visiting their yard. The amount of bird, the impact they have on bird populations is, is like a pin drop compared to habitat loss, cats, um, window strikes, um, you know, loss of habitat. I mean, these, no, yeah. In fact, in fact, something like screech owls don't actually take a lot of birds. That is part of their diet, but they eat moths, they eat mice, um, they, they eat anything they could get a hold of, small frogs, maybe a bird once in a while, they'll get roosting on a branch somewhere, but no, they, they don't wipe out birds. No. Thank you for asking that. I think that's it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Mike. And thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Great crowd. And we loved all the pictures and all the stories. And we'll, well have to do it again. Idea. I, 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 I cut short everything I want to say because I realize I'm, I'm, I'm limited on time here, but my God, I could have just ran. I know, you could go on, on for weeks and weeks and weeks and still have more to say. So many yeah. fun things and stories that come to mind. I'm like, I don't have time for that. But yeah. anyway. Well, well, we'll, we'll have you back some... soon and hope everybody else will join us. Yes. Um, yes. Good night, all. Thanks again for being with us. Stay safe, stay healthy. Very good. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you out on the trails. With your mask on. Yes. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Take Beautiful. care. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Mike. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, Good Mike. Night. Take Good care. Night. Wear Take your mask. Care. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. Good to see everybody. Definitely. Good to be here. We'll soon be together in person again. Yes. Yes, please. Take care. Great night. All right. I'm going to clock out. Good night, okay. everyone. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Mike. Bye. Bye. Uh, okay, folks, I'm turning us off. If anybody needs the recording, just email me. Can we get a recording? Get I'm, a recording. It's recording now. I need to actually stop the recording right now. Yep. Okay. Yes.